scripture reading for today comes from Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. I read it for you. Genesis chapter 15, verses 18 through 21. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, the Kenite, and the Kenizzite, and the Kadmonite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Rephaim, and the Amorite, and the Canaanite, and the Gargashite, and the Jebusite. This is the word of God. Amen. Evangelist Joanna and uh, also missionary Joanna is from our main church, Kangangir Church in Seoul, and she has been uh, being called in different parts of the world to share the word, and it is our privilege today to have Evangelist Joanna here to share the word of God, and she will share the word with the title, Let Us Conquer Canaan. And as she comes up, let us welcome her by saying hallelujah. hallelujah. a great privilege and honor to be here to witness our Father God's miraculous work through you guys. And uh, I just keep thinking how beautiful our Father is and how our God is and how He surely will fulfill the good work that He began in us. And um, I really thank God and I thank all of you. Uh, so I'd like to share grace with you titled Let's Conquer Canaan. Canaan is a very important place to us, not only for us, but to our God as well. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 6 says that God had searched out this land for us. That's how important this land is for him. And we know that Enoch was taken to heaven alive because he did what so well. He walked with God. But how can we walk with God if our destination and our God's destination are different? What if the Canaan that I imagine is different from the Canaan the Father has prepared for us? Then how can we be walking together? So I pray that our Father will help us this morning. The, the Canaan that in his heart will come to our heart. Amen? Yeah. So in order to understand how important Canaan is to our God, we have to actually look at the entire history of the ground of this earth, according to the Bible. And I'll have to digest that. Um, for information, uh, a lot of this message will be found in the eighth book of the History of Mission series. Now the eighth book is entitled the fulfillment of the covenant of the torch, which is the conquest of Canaan. Well, to understand the importance of Canaan, we have to go all the way back to the time of Adam. We know that Adam received this profound covenant, the living word from God, right? Because he's created with the breath of life. It became living, right? So now he was taken to the Lord of Eden to cultivate and keep it, but we know ultimately what he was unable to keep was the word that was in his heart. And Adam rejected the word from his heart and instead received the serpent's word, right? But what we see after this is even more shocking. The fault is with Adam. Yet the consequence falls upon the ground. The cursed is the ground because of you, God says, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 17 and 18. The ground is cursed. And so now, as we know, it's supposed to be thorn. Thorns and this is filled the ground. 
What happens if the thorns and thistles fill the ground? There cannot be fruit, right? So Adam will have to take away these thorns and thistles in order to get fruit from this point on. Hosea chapter 6, verse 7, clearly says that Adam transgressed the covenant. And as a result, the ground is cursed. God is already defining the relationship between men, the Lord of creation, right? Everything was created for mankind. When he falls, God defines already from the beginning of the Bible that the earth will also fall together. It's like a nation and a president in their relationship, right? I can speak a lot about Korea right now. When the president does well, nation prospers. But when the president fails, the nation will suffer. And from the very beginning of the Bible, God is saying, this is exactly what's happening to this world. And it's all on our shoulders. And we know that it gets worse in times of Cain. He's worse than Adam. He not only rejects the word, but now he kills his brother. And as a result, we can see in Genesis chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, then now the ground will have no fruit. It doesn't matter how much Cain will work or labor. The ground will just fail to yield fruit. And it goes even wor worse in Noah's days. If you start with Genesis chapter 6, and we remember chapter 7 is when all the judgment of the flood takes place. But prior to this judgment to taking place, we see in Genesis 6, it starts clearly with the sons of God. How sons of God goes after the daughters of men and begin to corrupt themselves, right? The subject is clearly the sons of God, but we see in verse 11 and 12, the subject changes. Now in God's sight, when it looks like the world, now it is the earth that is filled with the violence. It is the earth that is corrupt. The subject is now the earth. Let us turn to Genesis chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. See? Let's read together. Ready? Begin. Now the earth was corrupt in the sight of God, and the earth was filled with violence. Thank you. You see? It truly began with the sons of God, but now God sees the earth is filled with violence and corruption. So, chapter 7 clearly tells that all the judgment came upon the earth. There's in Genesis chapter 7, verse 4, 6, 10, 12, and verse 17, and 18, and 24. Over and over again, God says, that he sent rain upon the earth for 40 days. The flood came upon the earth. The flood came upon the earth and prevailed on the earth. So already we can see the important relationship between men and earth. And here comes, because of the judgment, the flood, we have now new, have a new earth. And God begins this work again with the second person in history of redemption. It's Abraham. With Abraham, again, God trying to restore this world, he makes covenant with Abraham. And we know this covenant is the covenant of torch. And he promises Canaan. That is in our opening verse in Genesis chapter 15, verse 18 to 21. This Canaan is so to God, as we saw earlier in Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 6, that God searched out this land, right? And we must note that by the time that God speaking to Abraham, this was 636 years before his descendants will actually get the land. But look at the content of what God says to Abraham. Shall we turn to 
Genesis chapter 15, verse 18 through 21. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants I have given this land, and he already defines a border. We can see this land was very, very important. It was already prepared from long ago for our God. It's from the river of Egypt as far as the great river, the river of Euphrates. And then he says something even more shocking. This land that he has so prepared is not empty. It's not that when the spies went to the land of Canaan that they found out there were inhabitants. Already God told the forefather of faith, Abraham, that there are these Canaanites. Next verse, please. The Kenite, the Canaanite, and the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Perizzite, and the Rephaim, and the Amorite, the Canaanite, and Gerbishite, and Jebusite. For visual effect, I'm going to actually draw these. This is the Canaan that God wants his children to conquer. And could you tell me the ten tribes? Kenite. Kansans, Canaanites, Hittite. There must be a reason why he Perizzite, Euphane, Amorite. important characteristics of the covenant of God. We human always pray for God's word to be fulfilled like this. Right. But hereby, God telling Abraham that there will be ten Canaanite tribes to be driven out for the descendants to inherit the land, it shows there is a process. There is always a process in the fulfillment of God's covenant. And you know, if God the Father is saying, hey, this land is filled with these 10 tribes, these tribes that are like giants to them, then don't you think the Father God is able to also drive them out? The God who will give the land takes full responsibility to also drive out these Canaanite tribes. That's why he tells Abraham 636 years before even this actually happens. So in order to equip his people to just do this in the times of Moses, when the Israelites indeed come out of Egypt and are heading toward the Canaan land, God does something very profound. He makes covenant with his people again. And we know from this, today's perspective, this is the first covenant, the old covenant, right? Through Moses. What God does to he strengthen the people so that they can become conquerors of the land of Canaan, he comes, as we see in Genesis chapter 20, verse 1 through 17, with 10 words. This word is so important to God. So important that God himself comes down to this world and speak to his people with his own lips. This word is so important that God inscribes his words not on the paper, not on the wood, but on these everlasting stones. This word will never be erased. That's how important these words are. So once again, God puts the word of God into the hearts of the people before they go into the land of Canaan. The word is never meant for the Israelites to use in the wilderness. The word is entirely for Israel's life in Canaan. Therefore, this word was a guarantee to the Israelites that they will enter where? Canaan land. 
So the subordinate stuff was guaranteed for their inheritance of the Canaan, and therefore, brothers and sisters, the word that God gives us today also is a guarantee for our inheritance of what? The spiritual Canaan, the kingdom of God. This word is not to be used for our daily use in this in the physical world. I mean, it is in a way, right? But what I'm trying to say is, this word that we come to, to receive at this church is not just for the church. Church is a transition to your final des destination, the kingdom of God. The word that we receive here from this church is for you to use once you enter into the kingdom of God. So again, we must redefine what the kingdom of God is also, right? It's definitely not a place you go only after you die. It's something to be realized on this earth just as Israelites did make into Canaan a life. And so after they received the word, God established Canaan as the center of the world. That's in Ezekiel, chapter 38, verse 12, and many other verses in the Bible. So each and every one of you, once you receive the word of our living God, it doesn't matter if you live in Singapore, in Korea, or in the deep in the woods, that nobody can find you out. You are now the center of the world. I believe the Zion Church here in Singapore is truly the center of the word world for you have received the word from our living Father God. Amen? Amen. So God established his word into the hearts of the people so that God will establish Canaan as the capital of this world and the Canaan will become the foothold for Father God now from where his campaign was spread out to the rest of the world. That is the reason that God chose Canaan as his capital. And the people were chosen just for this. Nevertheless, here comes the misunderstanding between God and men again. They now enter Canaan, the old, long-awaited promised land. They drew, they drove out the Canaanites, yes. Uh, we know not 100%, but they did pretty well because they did conquer Canaan and they took all the lands as their inheritance among the 12 tribes, right? But they thought that God told them to drive out the Canaanites just to create the living space for them. As long as they live here, we cannot live here, right? Big misunderstanding. They didn't understand the intention of God why God told them to drive out the Canaanites. That intention is found in Exodus chapter 23, verse 32 to 33. God says, drive them out because they will make you sin against me. It's not that, hey, you're taking my space, I have to, you have to get out and I have to stay here. It's not like that. Ultimately, they have to drive them out so that Israelites will not do what against God? Not sin against God. So in Exodus 23, verse 32, it reads, You shall make no covenant with them or with their gods. They shall not live in, un in, live in your land, because they will make you sin against me. For if you serve their gods, it will surely be a snare to you. They drove out the Canaanites, but they still sinned against God. And the Bible says they ended up polluting the land, the promised land, which they have actually inherited. Let's turn to Isaiah, chapter 24, verse 5. Here's God's definition of polluting the land. His definition, our definition, is so different. Isaiah chapter 24 verse 5 says, The earth is also polluted by its inhabitants. Yes, we talk about the global warming, the global pollution, right? CO2 and whatnot. But God's explanation is different. For they 
transgress the laws, for they violate statutes. They broke the everlasting covenant. We pollute the land when we break the covenant. We pollute the land when we reject the word of God. They have committed many idolatries, many transgressions of the covenants. So God says, let's read some of the examples. If you turn to Psalm 106, verse 38. Evangelist John will actually speak a lot about these gods that the people served in the ancient days. This is a god referring to Molech. But this is very interesting. <laughs> Psalm 106, verse 38 says, When you shed the blood, that blood defiles the land. Okay? And it says, You shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and their daughters. Why? Because of parents are sacrificing their children to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with that blood. So we just read in Isaiah 24 verse 5, when we transgress, when we break the everlasting covenant of God, we pollute the land, right? When we follow after, as parents, the idols of this world, we are shedding the blood of our children. And that blood Every time I pursue the idols of this world for my children's well-being, we say, we are also shedding the blood of our dearest children and pulling to the land. This is what our living God is telling us. So, they are in their promised land. God gave them God's word and they rejected the word. Those of you who study the Bible a lot, uh, we know that the ground in the Bible symbolizes the heart, right? We learn like that. But it's not just spiritual. God is clearly pointing both the spiritual side and the physical side of his world. When we reject the word from our heart, which is spiritual side, there will clearly be consequences in the physical side. What happened as a result? of Israelites polluting the promised land. They lost their nation. History redemption is behind every moment of the world history that we live in. Again, the Bible is pointing to us the fact that it is the state of man's heart that is creating all of these consequences. Yet, our God, being so faithful in his good will, he sends the Lord Jesus Christ to heal the land. When Jesus Christ came, everybody thought, oh, he's the true man to become king of our nation. He's the powerful man who will release us from this bondage on this Roman Empire, right? But again, people were mistaken. Jesus, the creator of all things in heaven and earth, when the word came down to this earth, he scans every heart of a man. He scans all the creatures. Our creator is seeing if everything is working just the way everything was created. Right? And what does it define about the state of the land? <coughs> It's not the nation that you need to be released. He points out, it is your heart that needs imminent healing. Right? So Jesus defines what good land is. He says, let us go to our Jesus' words. Jesus says in Luke chapter 8, verse 15. Luke chapter 8 verse 15 says, 
But the seed in the good soil, these are the ones who have first heard the word. In an honest and good heart. And two, holy fast. And three, endure to bear fruit. Okay, good land, right? We know how our land has been corrupt so there cannot be any fruit, right? Jesus says good land. First, you have to hear the word to qualify as good land. Hallelujah. You're all here hearing the word of God. Amen? But that's not everything. Step two, hold it fast. We don't use the expression, hold it fast, if there's no one coming after you to snatch it away from you, right? You have to keep it tight. Make sure to succeed in protecting it. Nobody can steal it away from you. Right? And third, we don't use the word endure if it doesn't take a long time. If there is no growing process, there is no such thing as endure, right? But he says you must endure the, by keeping the word that you have, you have heard, until when? Until you bear the fruit. Why? Because God says the kingdom of God is given to only those who bear fruit. That is in Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. Let's check the verse together, shall we? Ready? Begin. Matthew chapter 21, verse 43. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people producing, right? Yeah. So we must become a good heart. And so what is the fruit? Well, we must define the fruit, right? What kind of fruit should we bear? So let's go to Luke chapter 6, 43 through 46. This is the old famous story about you can tell what kind of tree it is by looking at the fruit, right? This is this verse. Verse 43. For there is no good tree which produces bad fruit, nor, on the other hand, a bad tree which produces good fruit. Each tree is known by its own fruit, right? Ah, so reading this, you wonder, what kind of tree am I? Verse 45. God, Jesus says, every man has a treasure in his heart. 45, the good man, out of the good treasure of his heart, brings forth what is good. And the evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth what is evil. And here comes, for his mouth speaks from that which fills his heart. So what is the fruit? The words that come from our heart. Whoa. Have you ever like stopped and thought about if I say this, we we go to heaven? I believe our Father who has led every precious saint to this far will surely bless you to undergo spiritual training and discipline so now, the words that come from our mouth yeah, will be beautiful food to our Father God. Amen? And there is this enduring part and holding a fast part, okay? There is a process to it. I believe you're all there. But this, the Pharisees and Sadducees come to this Jesus that he's saying you must bear fruit to enter into the kingdom of God. And then the Sadducees and Pharisees says, Wow, Jesus, you disciples are so dirty. You know the, the law says you must wash your hands before you eat, right? How can they eat with the clean hand, uh, dirty hands? And then Jesus says, What makes you dirty is not the outside. Just like this verse says, right? What makes you dirty is inside. And our Creator, our God, scans men's heart. Are you ready for the list? We are here this morning in the presence of our God, our Creator. 
Let us not hide ourselves anymore like Adam did after he sinned. Jesus is pointing out the things in our heart. Let us unveil our heart. Commit our heart to Jesus and list every defile things in our heart one by one by faith, asking him, you are our creator and heal us. Okay? Let's do this with all the courage and boldness and complete trust in our Father God. Let us turn. That is in Mark chapter 7. Twenty through twenty-three. So, like the Canaanite tribes, I'm going to write down what is in her heart, taking the space. Okay. Verse twenty. And then Jesus added, "It is what comes from inside that defiles you, for from within, out of a person's heart, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft." murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander, pride, and foolishness. All these vile things come from within. They are what defile you. So in our heart, shall we write this down together? Evil thoughts. Sexual immorality. Theft, murder, adultery, greed, wickedness, deceit, lustful desires, envy, slander. So I'm just talking bad about other people, right? Pride. And even Jesus points out our foolishness. <clears throat> the Word became flesh to dwell among us. He didn't want to be dwelt outside on the graphite stone. The word became flesh to come dwell among us, in us. Right. And yet when this God, the word, came to his people, to his land, the people did not have enough room in their heart to receive this word. Jesus says in Rome chapter 8 verse 37, you try to kill me because my word has no place in you. This is the state of the heart. Why do you think Jesus is pointing out? Why is he scanning our heart and revealing, exposing such a dirty filthiness of a heart to condemn us? No, so we can turn to our Creator to admit ourselves that we are at fault. We have brought this catastrophe in this world that we live in. That's what Jesus is wanting to hear. But Sadducees and Pharisees talk about, hey, your hands are dirty, you can wash your hands. Jesus is in, in rage saying, you have turned my word into teachings of men. I came here to heal your heart. And this scene is juxtaposed with the next incident. The famous Canaanite, the Syrophoenician woman, her daughter is possessed with demon. These things you may say, oh, the list, okay. You know, everybody has one of those, right? This woman's daughter is possessed with a demon. Even worse than we can ever imagine, right? And what does she do? Let's turn to Mark, the same chapter 7, verse 25 and 26. Verse 25 says, But after hearing of him, a woman 
whose little daughter had an unclean spirit, immediately came and fell at his feet. And then Jesus says, this is Gentile of the Syrophoenician race. And she kept asking him to cast out the demon out of her daughter. This is a famous part. Remember, Jesus says, oh, I have not come to give the precious word to dogs. How would you feel if you are kicked away like that, right? But knowing that there's a demon in her daughter, knowing that he can truly release my daughter from this bondage, she says, even the dogs eat the crumbs of the bread falling off the children's table. Even just a bit of your word, you'll heal my daughter. This confession from her mouth brought the miracle. Let's turn to verse 29. Uh, verse 28 first, sorry. Verse 28. Next verse, please. Could he begin? But she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord. But even the dogs under the table feed on the children's crumbs. Verse 29, and he said to her, because of this answer, go. The demon has gone out of your daughter. Let us turn to Jesus. He who is exposed in heart is more than able to heal our hearts. But we know the history. Our God came to his people came to his land, but they rejected him. But God did not reject the man. Jesus says, Abba, Father, I gave this, I brought this word for your people. None has room in their hearts to receive this word. What shall I do? What shall I do? And God says, Leviticus chapter 17, verse 11, the life is in the blood. Put the word in your blood. God came all the way from heaven to give the word to us. And we rejected his word. And so what does he do? He dies on the cross. He puts every bit of his life, the word, into his blood. The blood soaks his body, trenches his body. The blood trenches the wooden cross. And this blood soaks and trenches, falls over to the hill of Golgotha and pours onto the very ground which we have defiled and polluted. Brothers and sisters, the work of the cross on the hill of Golgotha was God's magnificent expression of his love. The covenant His word unto our hearts. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25. Jesus says, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. What is the new covenant? In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 3, our God so desired to write His word not on the tablets of stone, but on the tablet of our hearts. So what kind of seed has been sown in us? I have an apple seed. If you sow an apple seed, when it grows, what is the name of this tree? What has our Lord Jesus Christ sown in our hearts? First Peter chapter 1 verse 23 tells us. <clears throat> Let's turn to 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 23. Let's read this together. Ready, begin. <clears throat> Right? The seed that's sown in you is not perishable, but it's imperishable. <clears throat> it's 
excuse me. And it is a living and enduring word of God. It will never die. It will always be living. And hence the seed that's sown in us is seed of life. And if the seed of life grows in you, what tree will you become? If life has been sown in you, what tree will you become? Yeah. Reverend Aaron Park um, wrote many uh, amazing words in his handwriting. Some of them are captured and we sometimes kind of post it around the Moriah Sanctuary as you will you walk by it. And it's not translated in English, it's only in Korean. But there's this word right now. It says, May all my will become his will so that I become the tree of life. I believe our Father, with this amazing faithfulness, has sown that seed of life in everyone over here at Zion Church. He truly endured. He truly held us fast so we could be here to this day. And we know in the end, in the new heaven and new earth, right? So we have to go to Revelation chapter 22, verse 2. It talks about the tree of life on both sides of the river of life, right? And it says, the leaves of that tree will heal many, many nations. You are the foothold of our living Father God. Right now, from here until here, all creations are groaning and suffering. The ground that was cursed because of our sin is crying out every moment, waiting for the appearance of whom? That is in Romans chapter 8, verse 19 and 22. Let's turn to verse 22 first, shall we? Romans chapter 8, verse 22. Ready? For we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. Right? And verse 19, what are they waiting for? What are they groaning for? Verse 19, ready? For the anxious longing of the creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. I believe the Zion Church exists for this purpose. I did not know until I studied this how every individual is so precious in God's sight and his work of redemptive history. When one person turns to God, when one person keeps the word in his heart. He is more than mighty to heal nations. That is in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. He says, oh, 2 Chronicles, Chapter 7, verse 14. Thank you. And my people who are called by my name. Amen. That is us, right? And my people who are called by my name. That's the first criteria. If they want, humble themselves. Two, pray and seek my face. Three, and turn from their wicked ways. This is a criteria. So you say, well, our heart is like this. But we learn from the Syrophoenician woman, right? We come and fall at the feet of Jesus. He says, pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. Doesn't mean just get rid of all the wicked ways. God knows that we do not have the power. Right? 
on his turn. Here, I've been doing all this wicked ways, right? God says, turn and seek my face. I believe that is what we're doing this morning. We admit that we were doing this. We are so powerless. This complete depravity of mankind, we cannot handle. So we commit all our heart to our Father God this morning together. And when we do this, God says, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin, and I will heal this land. I believe you will bring about great healing, not only in your personal lives, but in the Singapore and for the rest of the world, Amen. as the Father promised us. Amen. Amen. So the conqueror, Joshua, right? To God, what does he always say? Don't be afraid. Be strong. Be courageous. For I am with you wherever you go. And keep my word in your heart. Amen? Amen. Amen. I pray that this blessing has already come upon Zion Church. Amen. Let us close with prayer.